Hi, everyone. So I think we're going to get started now. Is everybody, are all the panelists ready to go? Seems like it. Great. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is um, um, in a very challenging moment. Um, this is also, this is really exciting for us to see so many friends and comrades uh, join us in this struggle and support this effort. We've been working on it off and on, mostly on, for about a year. Um, and uh, we're very excited uh, for today. We founded the Committee of Anti-Imperialists and Solidarity with Iran, uh, we call ourselves Qasi, to provide clarity of analysis on Iran and the broader anti-imperialist struggle around the world to take action and stand with all peoples in challenging US imperialism and warfare, both in the, in the United States and around the world, and to launch an anti-sanctions campaign that's grounded in anti-imperialism. We stand with the people of Iran in our struggle against imperialism because we know all too well that liberation has never arrived on the backs of US tanks, bombs, or sanctions. What you're gonna hear from our panelists today is both historical and political analysis on US imperialism in Iran and the Arab region. And we will be dispelling a lot of the mythologies about Iran that both the right and the so-called left have embraced, including the mythology of normalization as a path to peace. For more information about the organization, and we'll share all this at the end, but I wanna share it now as well. You can visit our website at www.solidarityiran.org, not to be confused with Iran Solidarity, which is a very different website. And there you're gonna find a monthly blog and also our points of unity, which I also encourage you to check out so that you get a better sense of who we are if you haven't already. The monthly blog, right now there are three articles up there and we're going to try to post several articles every month. Through the website, you can join our mailing list or sign up to join the organization as well. And um, we're going to plan a membership meeting for new members in October. So please sign up now if you're interested because we're gonna start planning that meeting uh, next week. The panel will be taped and aired on the East as a podcast, which is an excellent podcast that I encourage you to follow and listen to. Its founder, Sina Rahmani, is one of the, uh, wrote one of the articles on our first blog post. So let's get to it. The order of our speakers today are Vida Sami Ion, Max Isle, myself, and Charlotte Cates. Nicole Savia, unfortunately, was not able to join us because of a last minute um, issue, um, but hopefully we'll have her involved in future panels. She'll be replaced by Charlotte, um, who's a lawyer with the National Lawyers Guild, and I'll read her bio in a moment. So I'm gonna just run through the bios of each of the speakers really quickly. Vida Samiyan is a visiting researcher in linguistics at UCLA, where she obtained her PhD in linguistics in 1983. She's also a professor and dean emerita at Cal State University, Fresno, where she taught linguistics and served as dean of the College of Arts and Humanities for 33 years and as director of the Middle East Studies program. In 2017, she resigned in objection to the university's mishandling of the Edward Said professorship, an endowed professorship for the Middle East Studies program. When the names of the finalists, all of Palestinian and Arab American ethnicity became public, the administration caved into Zionist pressure groups and canceled the search. Her, res her resignation resulted in a public outcry. While she was a student at UCLA, she was active in the anti-war movement and the, in the Iranian student movement against the Shah and US imperial domina imperialist domination in Iran. She served as secretary of Sisnu, Confederation of Iranian Students in Frankfurt, Germany from 1976 to 1978 and returned to, ninth, to Iran in 1979. There she was also active in the movement for women's rights. Awesome bio, Vida John. <laughs> Max is an associated researcher at the Tunisian Observatory for Food Sovereignty and the Environment and Rights on Rural Development. His book, A People's New Green New Deal, is forthcoming from Pluto Press in 2021, and he's on Twitter at Max Isle. Charlotte Cates is the national coordinator of the NLG's International Committee and the international coordinator of Sami Dun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network. She will make short comments about the unlawfulness of sanctions and other actions taken by the US against sanctioned countries. Lastly, so we're gonna get started. Uh, uh, Vida Jun's gonna open for us. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the chat box or the Q&A box. And again, welcome to everybody, especially to those in different time zones um, for whom it's very late. Uh, the folks in Asia and Africa. Okay, let's get started. Um, 
Today, I'll briefly address the history of U.S.-Iran relations since the 1950s and the shifting pattern of U.S. imperialist domination by looking at uh, the covert 1953 CIA coup, um, the subsequent 25 years of the Shah's dictatorship, and the U.S.'s overt response in the last 40 years to the establishment of an independent state with crippling sanctions, economic warfare, and military threats to create the conditions for a regime change. In the process, I hope to underscore the necessity for us, Iranians, North Americans, and internationalists, to become actively engaged in the fight against US imperialism. Because these crimes are committed in our names, and we must bear responsibility for what the US government does around the world. So the 1953 coup, in, in the 20th and 21st century, we have witnessed a new imperialism through US interventions for economic gain and political domination in developing countries, particularly in Latin America and West Asia. The result has been the establishment of servile, corrupt, brutal regimes and military juntas. In Iran in 1953, we witnessed a covert CIA-engineered coup, Operation Ajax, with British collaboration. The coup deposed the first constitutionally elected nationalist government of Dr. Mossadegh, bringing back to power the Shah, an agent of US and British imperialism. Dr. Mossadegh, a beloved popular leader and respected intellectual, had committed the great sin of nationalizing Iran's oil from British control in 1951. Mossadegh was arrested, tried, jailed for three years, and had to spend the rest of his life under house arrest. Many members of his cabinet, leaders of the National Front, and the Communist Tudeh Party were jailed, exiled, or executed. A bloody suppression of the opposition followed. The National Front was outlawed. The Shah ordered the execution of many, including student leaders. The Communist Tudeh Party bore major crackdown with more than 4,000 arrests of political activists, many tortured to death or executed. <coughs> the Eisenhower administration viewed Operation Ajax as a success, and according to Kinzer 2007, Quote, overnight, CIA became a central part of the American foreign policy apparatus, with covert action regarded as a cheap and effective way to shape the course of world history, unquote. The following year, another CIA coup, Operation PB Success, toppled the democratically elected government of Jacopo Arbenz Guzman who had nationalized farmland of the American-owned United Fruit Company in Guatemala. Once back in power, the Shah created a client state for the United States, rolling back the income from oil into the US military industrial complex. Iran became armed to the teeth serving as the gendarme of the region to safeguard US and British interests in West Asia. And the Shah developed a symbiotic relationship with the colonial state of Israel. Internally, the Shah established a dictatorship. <coughs> he developed a notorious secret service, Sawak, trained by Israel and the US arrested any opposition resulting in thousands of political prisoners, tortures, and executions. A major uprising in June 1963 was in response to the arrest of Khomeini following his denouncement of the Shah and Israel. Khomeini was jailed and then exiled to Iraq in 1964. Meanwhile, the student movement against the Shah continued to grow at Tehran University. An underground leftist armed opposition emerged inside Iran. 
Some activists went abroad, forming underground groups, and the monumental international student movement emerged in Europe and the United States, the Confederation of Iranian Students, to denounce and expose the Shah as an agent of US imperialism. Despite the fact that we in Iran knew well the story of the 1953 coup, the US government's role in the coup was kept from the American people and the rest of the world until 1979, when the main CIA operative responsible for the coup, Kermit Roosevelt, actually the grandson of Theodore Roosevelt, published a book titled Counter Coup, The Struggle for the Control of Iran. It is ironic that the book and the public acknowledgement of the CIA's role came out in the same year that the Shah's government was toppled. In an article titled, What Kermit Roosevelt Didn't Say, Sassan Fayez Manish describes the conditions in Iran after the coup, something that my generation and I personally at the age of six painfully experienced. And here I quote, I, along with many Iranians of my generation, knew the story full well and did not need Kermit to repeat it. We knew that the Shah owed his throne to the likes of Kermit, but we also knew something that Kermit didn't know or didn't say. We knew that we owe to the Kermits of this world our tortured past. And here recounting what living under the dictatorship of a megalomaniac meant to us, he writes, quote, years of being hushed by our parents, fearful of being arrested, if we uttered a critical word about his majesty's government or his American advisors, years of worrying about the secret police sabak informants who were smartly but ruthlessly trained by the best of USS CIA and Israel's Mossad. Years of witnessing our friends and acquaintances being jailed, some never heard from again. Years of hearing about people dying under torture or quietly executed. Years of being exiled in a foreign country, which ironically was the belly of the beast, the metropolis the center which masterminded much of our misfortune in the first place. Years of spending our precious youth to free or save thousands of political prisoners by marching in the streets of the metropolis, wearing masks to hide our identities and looking bizarre to those who knew nothing about our story. And finally, years of trying to prove to the American people that the 1953 CIA coup was not a fig leaf of our imagination or a conspiracy theory, that it indeed happened, and that they, whether they like it or not, have a certain culpability in what their government does around the world." Unquote. Today, many of the documents have been released, and the story of the CIA coup and British involvement in Iran is well documented. As Irvand Abrahimian, author of the coup 1953, said in an interview, quote, as an agent of US imperialist interest in the region, who was brought back to power by a CIA coup, the Shah lost legitimacy in the eyes of the Iranian people in 1953 and could never regain it. It was this loss of legitimacy that partially led to the massive revolutionary movement of 1978-79, something totally unprecedented in terms of its single focus against the Shah and the US government, and its magnitude and unity encompassing all sectors of the society. So now on to the US response to the 1979 revolution. Much of the information in this section comes from two volumes by Fayez Manish, The United States and Iran, Sanctions, Wars, and the Policy of Dual Containment. Um, one volume is 2008 and one volume is 2013. In the absence of an organized left, the Islamic opposition led by exile 
cleric Khomeini took charge. What the Islamic leadership had promised the people was independence and freedom. Independence meant an end to US political, economic, and military control of the people and the country. This was something that they delivered from the start. And what followed in the next 40 years has been US's response to this great sin of independence. The response has been 40 years of crippling sanctions, wars, and military threats through the policy of containment. Containment could mean anything from keeping a country in check multilaterally, economically, and politically to its total devastation and destruction, as we saw in the case of Iraq. The goal has been destruction and devastation of Iran's economy in hope of fomenting unrest for regime change to reinstate a US-Israel friendly government. A detailed look at different US administration's policies and interventions in the last 40 years leads to the following generalizations. First, there has been little to no difference between Republicans and Democrats in terms of the US policy towards Iran. We can see the continuity of the policy of containment in all the administrations since 1979, beginning with Carter administration. Second, Israel directly and through its affiliate interest groups, such as APAC, American Israel Public Affairs Committee, WINEP, Washington Institute for Near Eastern Policy, UANI, United Against the Nuclear Iran, and through individuals connected with these interest groups working in different administrations, Israel has been actively and continuously engaged in influencing and shaping the US policy towards Iran and the, and the region. For example, Martin Indyk, former head of WINEP, twice ambassador to Israel, served as national security advisor to Bill Clinton and claims to have come up with the policy of containment. Paul Wolfowitz, advisory board of WINEP, Washington Institute, served as undersecretary of defense for policy under G.W. Bush, director of policy planning under Reagan, deputy secretary of defense under George W. Bush. Richard Pearl, also advisory board of Washington Institute, known as architect of, of the Iraq war, served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Global Strategic Affairs under Reagan administration, and was key advisor to Rumsfeld under GW Bush administration. Dennis Ross, also on Washington Institute and founder of a Jerusalem-based think tank, uh, Jewish People Policy Planning Institute. He served as special assistant to the president and senior director for the central re region in, during Obama's first term. Uh, Gary Seymour is a founding member of um, United Against Nuclear Iran. He also served uh, in the first term in Obama's administration. The third point I like to make is that the discussion of US-Israeli policy towards Iran is closely tied to that of Iraq, as the goal from the beginning was dual containment of both Iraq and Iran through sanctions and wars. And of course, we saw what happened to Iraq through three wars and a complete devastation of the country. Half a million children died and a million dead both in Iraq and Iran as a result of the eight-year war. Finally, the point I'd like to make is about the sanctions, and this is going to be brief because we have another speaker on the sanctions, but uh, the sanctions come in different forms, unilateral executive orders. Um, congressional sanctions were particularly brutal, the 1996 ILSA, um, 
Iran-Libya Sanction Act under Bill Clinton and the 2010 CISADA Comprehensive Iran Sanctions Accountability and Divestment Act was signed into law by Obama. And of course, the sanctioning of the central, Iran's central bank, bank, which has been devastating, was signed by Obama. So I've left out the second term of Obama's presidency with John Kerry serving as Secretary of State and the old guard, Dennis Ross, Stuart Levy, Gary Seymour, and Hillary Clinton leaving. This, of course, led to the successful JCPOA agreement, which was reversed by Donald Trump, as we all know. Thank you very much, Vidajun. That was an excellent start to the panel. Max, you're up next. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Vida. So I'm going to discuss um, imperialism and how we think about it on the US left. Very often on the US left, imperialism is unfortunately used to describe a state doing things outside its borders that someone considers wrong. So we have professors of Marxism who are signing petitions referring to Iranian imperialism in Yemen, for example, the former, a country surrounded by US military installations, and the latter, a country suffering under US inflicted famine. Very briefly, I would like to do three things today. One, I want to offer a more rigorous way to understand imperialism that helps us distinguish it from near foreign power projection, which is a constant in world history. Building on that, I want to briefly discuss the imperialist agenda in Iran. Not how, is, not how Iran is being targeted, but why it is being targeted. Three, I will discuss how we need to complement our understanding of imperialism with an understanding of the national question, which helps us to organize our thinking and therefore our action in and on the world today. First, what is imperialism? Imperialism is, on the one hand, a continuous flow of value from the periphery and semi-periphery of the world system to the core. Periphery and semi-periphery are technical terms that more colloquially we understand with the terms global south and global north. Value again is technical, but is expressed in price or in a capitalist world in capital. And what price or capital mean in our world is claims on the labor and resources of humanity. So when we discuss imperialism, we are discussing on the one hand the power dynamic, which ensures that value flows from south to north. On the other hand, we mean unequal accumulation on a world scale. That is, since value or riches or capital flows from the south to the north, it makes sense, like water flowing down a hill into a reservoir, that it pools unevenly at one place at the expense of another. Now, this does not happen naturally, ensuring that wealth accumulates in some places and does not in others is not necessarily easy. People resist being exploited. So mechanisms for wealth extraction continually shift. And when countries and their peoples resist hard enough, or for that matter, resist with some degree of success, they are attacked and often decapitated. For example, Bolivia. And we also know with the examples of Cuba and Venezuela and Iran, that countries which resist, or especially with Cuba and Venezuela, build up people's power, entrench revolutionary ideology amongst the population, harden themselves against assault, they are able to resist so far. And without enough help from us, the imperialists storm. 
The system of accumulation of wealth is a political system. It functioned at its peak under colonialism because the people living in colonized countries did not even have control over, the, over their own political systems. For that reason, they were exploited very often, even beyond their ability to survive, leading to famine across the South, from Egypt to India. Decolonization, the major event of the last century, shattered the political framework for value extraction. What followed in many, but by no means all countries, was neocolonialism. Within a neocolonial world, certain circuits of accumulation have been critical in the Arab and West Asian region. Especially under the Shah, these included weapon sales, and they also included control of oil revenues through petrodollar recycling and the privilege of the dollar being the world's reserve currency. This privilege for the US and US imperialism rests in large part on oil exchanging for dollars. The 1979 revolution partially broke apart that system. Zbigniew Brzezinski characterized that revolution with clear prescience as, quote, the destruction of the strategic pivot of the US sponsored shield for the Persian Gulf region. In 1980, it was clearly understood in the words of then Secretary of Defense William Brown, again quotation, that Iran probably will still not be at all easy to deal with. This is the realm of geopolitics. In discussing what is labeled geopolitics, often dismissively, we are actually discussing the political architecture of imperialism, its chosen battlefields, and the political structure within which people live, die, and try to live decent lives. Iran continues to be targeted by imperialism because imperialism is part of capitalism. Capitalism rests on the continuous expansion of accumulation and thus imperialism does not rest when, is, when it is defeated, when it loses control of a neo-colony, when it loses accumulation circuits, it seeks to regain them. It does not want smooth market operations. In Iran, imperialism lost on two fronts domestic economic policy, and also foreign policy. Imperialism is a historical system structured around a set of relationships and productive infrastructure through which peripheries complement cores in order for value to flow from the periphery to the core. Thus, what imperialism does not want are peripheries which turn inwards or connect their trade with the South. They want peripheries that are cheap labor forces for manufacturing, which do not use their oil revenue for their people in any way, shape, or form, and which do not challenge the core monopoly on technology and intellectual production. When oil money is redirected, as it was in Iran, from weapon spending to university spending, to partially sovereign industrialization, or to rural health clinics, these are domestic challenges to the previous imperialist economic architecture, whether or not they are sufficient for popular purposes is an entirely different question. All of that is within the sphere conventionally understood as domestic economic planning. Now clearly, the ability to structure your own domestic economy rests on political sovereignty. And furthermore, of course, a more popular based domestic economy strengthens political sovereignty. In this respect, in this very specific respect, the challenge of Iran has been, in the words of the Department of State, quoting, that it has continued its terrorist-related activity in 2014, including support for Palestinian terrorist groups in Gaza, Lebanese Hezbollah, and various groups in Iraq and throughout the Middle East, including what the Congressional Research Service refers disparagingly, disparagingly to, and again I quote, as Iranian support for the Houthis. In other words, Iran has attracted the ire of the United States for supporting Arab forces that are fighting for two reasons. One, in defense of their sovereignty, or two, for national liberation. This brings us to my concluding point, which is the national question which is habitually misunderstood or distorted on the Western left. When we discuss the national question, we mean simply that the world historically and in the present is structured on hierarchical lines. 
the U.S. imposes suffering, imposes underdevelopment, and imposes de-development on the nations of the periphery. The separation of the world into these zones of uneven accumulation means that resistance to global oppression has to account for that separation, which means resistance in the periphery often takes on a nationalist tone. This fact, in fact, imposes distinct but complementary tasks on people situated politically, situated geographically in the core and in the periphery. We have distinct but complementary struggles. The task in the core is safeguarding the right of the people in the periphery to determine their own fate above all and to not allow the illusion of virtual and vicarious solidarity to detract from that fundamental anti-imperialist task, which is not against solidarity, but in fact is solidarity in action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max, that was excellent. Thank you very much. So I'm going to begin by discussing the current climate of US relations with Iran. The thrust of my presentation is that normalization between the US and Iran is not a path to peace and will not liberate the Iranian people. Only anti-imperialism can do that. Obama's nuclear agreement was a step toward normalization on paper, but the sanctions were lifted or only lifted really on paper. In practice, the economy never re recovered or revived after the agreement was signed. The problem with the agreement, the the agreement had many problems, but the, the fundamental problem with the agreement from an international relations standpoint is that nations seek nuclear power in order to protect themselves. It's a tool of deterrence against invasion. Any IR theorist, international relations theorist will tell you that. This is the standard view of nuclear power in international relations theory. The only country in world history that has used nuclear power against another nation, the nuclear bomb, is the United States. So when it calls for the disarmament of Iran and other nations, its objective is not to save the world from the horrors of nuclear power. It's to weaken Iran so that it cannot effectively protect itself against imperialist invasions. The sanctions are meant to do the same thing, to weaken Iran the way they weakened Iraq prior to the US invasion. Most importantly, it's important to remember that the US routinely breaks treaties and agreements, especially those involving either colonialism here, recall all the treaties the US has broken with indigenous groups here, and settlement on this land, reg regarding colonialism and settlement on this land, or the expansion of its own economic and military power overseas. So there's a multitude of reasons why normalization is not possible between the US, regardless of whether the next administration is Democratic or Republican, and a nation like Iran. I list the most important reasons. I'm, I'm gonna do a quick recap of current events. As many of you likely recall, in January, Iranian General Ghassem Soleimani was assassinated by the US while visiting Iraq. He was a widely, widely loved political figure in Iran because he was central to the defeat of ISIS in the region. In his funeral procession, consider, it's said to be the largest in world history, but we don't know. Uh, Nasser's was also one of the largest. Khomeini's was also one of the largest. Over 5 million marched in the streets of different cities throughout Iran and Iraq. His murder was viewed as an act of war by much of the world. And as a result, anti-war demonstrations were held across the war against an impending attack on an impending U.S. attack on Iran. For several years now, there have been reports of increased activity by foreign-funded saboteurs like the Mujahideen al supported by the U.S. and Israel inside Iran. Oftentimes, when protests occur and critical infrastructure institutions that people need and regularly use on a day-to-day -day basis are damaged at heightened levels or in a highly organized manner, people tend to believe that foreign sabotage was somehow involved. That's not to say that protests don't happen without foreign sabotage. They certainly do. But it's the way in which um, uh, the riots, quote unquote, occur, what buildings they target, what institutions they target, and how the organization looks. This past summer, just recently, there have been over 20 unexplained explosions in Iran targeting hospitals, power plants, and other critical infrastructure that impact the daily lives of the people. 
Even mainstream U.S. news sources like the New York Times and the Washington Post have written that Israel is believed to be linked to at least some of these explosions. On August 16th, just exactly one month ago, the U.S. seized four tankers bound for Venezuela that contained over one million barrels of gas near the Strait of Hormoz. The movement of resources from Iran to Venezuela is part of an emerging South-South alliance developing between the two nations and including other nations like China as well. And in fact, um, one of the major universities in Iran is holding a South-South, a history of South-South relations conference, um, I think in November. So the, this is something that is definitely an emerging phenomenon and, some, and to look for um, as the new US administration comes into office. The US is now in possession of those ships, of the stolen cargo on those ships. And as far as we can tell, nobody knows where those tankers are. Pompeo tweeted on August 27th that the 30 day period to snap back UN sanctions on Iran comes to an end on September 20th in three days, at which time the US intends to enforce sanctions um, by confiscating Iranian ships and conducting other similar activities. The UN Security Council has responded that the US cannot use the snapback mechanism of the nuclear deal because it is no longer party to the deal. Again, having broken the deal like it's broken so many treaties since its inception. Liberal commentators believe that the US's objective here is to provoke Iran so that the Trump administration will have an October surprise on the eve of the election. But this is unlikely. The Islamic Republic is not easily provoked just recall what they did after the assassination of Soleimani, and it's never shown itself to be adventurous in its actions in response to imperialism. The recent normalization of relations between Israel, Bahrain, and the UAE is an expansion of Israeli military and economic power in the region, and it will most certainly function to limit Iranian sovereignty even further. Bahrain and UAE, I encourage you all to look at a map to see just how close Bahrain and UAE are to Iran. Bahrain and UAE are both just south of Iran in the Gulf and will likely be used as staging grounds for continued military action in Iran, both covert and overt. To the east and west of Iran are Afghanistan and Iraq, respectively, both riddled with US bases, but also mired in warfare. Iran has been able to fend off the US at those borders, but Bahrain and and, but the normalization of Bahrain and UAE with Israel creates a new front that the Iranians must now deal with as well. One that will be, at least in the short term, will be more challenging considering that Bahrain is an island in the Gulf. Iran and the other so-called hotspots continue to, like Venezuela, continue be, to be targets of US aggression. This issue, even though it enters the media cycle in waves, it, in practice, it doesn't come and go in waves. It is part and parcel of US foreign policy as an imperialist power. So I think this may be the first presidential election in, in recent history where Iran is not a part of the daily news cycle and the daily discussions. Every presidential candidate always brings up Iran regularly. Um, McCain said, bomb, 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 Iran. Iran. Obama said many things as well. This is the first time that we don't see it in the news cycle, but the policy continues, the hybrid warfare continues. As I said in my blog post on the website, Iran's geographic location in a resource rich area, combined with its history of socialist and anti colonial resistance and its current defiance against US imperialism, has made it a prime target of the US. For these reasons, we view Iran as central to the anti-imperialist struggle. The US continues a hybrid war against Iran as we speak, and we don't know what will happen after the election. Neither Trump nor Biden are interested in leaving, or taking their hands off Iran. And we expect that hostilities will continue and likely increase, irrespective of who wins the ele election, precisely because of Iran's centrality to the imperialist project. I urge you to take a look at our points of unity on our website, um, which will tell you a little bit about who we are and what kind of um, work we plan to do. But I wanna focus on one particular point of unity, which is the last one. We are committed to practicing a politics of the here and now. In order to transform the world, we must contend with it as it is where we are. Our job as those located within the, US, within the heart of US imperialism is to oppose it 
so that the peoples of the world may build their own societies free from the terror of imperial violence. This was a particularly important point for us to be clear about as we discussed who we are, because we believe that our job as people living in the belly of the beast is to defeat this empire so that the people of the world can create their own societies free from the violence of US imperialism in all its manifestations, whether, whether there are sanctions, assassinations, or military invasion. Iran cannot and will not be, I mean, I'm sorry, the US cannot and will not be defeated through normalization. Normalization only strengthens the power and influence of the US over nations like Iran. Without the defeat of US imperialism, none of us is free especially those in Asia, Africa, and Latin, and Latin America. We, so we have a duty to the peoples of the world to do what we can to defeat this empire. That's why we call ourselves anti-imperialists in solidarity with Iran. So we urge you to join us um, and support us as we uh, develop this effort. That's it, thank you very much. Charlotte, I think you're up next. Nina to be here today with all of those who have spoken already. Um, I regret that Nicole Savia is not able to be here with us today, but I do want to convey some of the same points that she was going to speak about regarding the illegality of U.S. sanctions on Iran, better, ter uh, better termed as unilateral coercive measures. And we use the term unilateral coercive measures because it more um, precisely describes what is happening when the U.S. imposes economic lateral in nature and they are coercive. They are intended to change the government and policies of another country in violation of the fundamental principles of sovereignty and self-determination. Now, of course, when we're speaking about law, um, it can be far too easy to kind of consider there to be a, a neutral legal system that is serving as an arbiter of justice in this case, and that there are violators of that system and that it, the system can be used to hold them accountable. But of course, when we are, when this is taking place in the context of an imperialist world system in which the United States is using its imperial power and control to effectuate those unilateral coercive measures and bring in other states as um, complicit partners in its violations of law, then, you know, reference to law itself can only be part of the way to fight back against those unilateral coercive measures and fight back against those sanctions that what the United States is doing, that these imperialist attacks are unlawful and illegal, but it is absolutely necessary to build a with um, peoples and nations fighting back against imperialism. Charlotte, you're, the feed is going in and out. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, we, we're hearing we're hearing most of what you're saying. Um, okay. Um, well, thanks for letting me know. I, but uh, <laughs> it must be a glitch in the internet connection. Um, is, is what I'm saying clear now? Yeah. Right now it's clear. Okay. Okay. Great. So. Um, just to note that we use the term unilateral coercive measures because it underlines the illegitimacy of those measures, that they're unilateral and they're coercive in nature. So they are um, under international law, the only body that has the legitimacy to effectuate any form of sanctions is the United Nations Security Council under Article 31 of the UN Charter. Under the UN Charter, under Article 2, Section 3, um, all members of the United Nations are obligated to settle their international disputes by peaceful means and to refrain from the threat of for or the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. And so this does not just mean the use of force as in the use of bombs and guns, although of course those bombs and guns and aircraft carriers are behind every act of economic warfare carried out by the United States. 
course of the use of force is also the use of economic measures to to destroy or attempt to destroy the economy and uh, global trade interactions of another sovereign state. It's in a sense, uh, unilateral course of measures of this nature are in a sense a form of siege and blockade carried out through the international banking system. And of course, we know that these financial sanctions are not just financial in nature. They are absolutely backed up by U.S. destroyers in, um, in the Gulf. They are backed up by the U.S. bases surrounding Iran. They are backed up by the U.S. mercenaries uh, showing up on the shores of Venezuela. They are backed up by contra warfare groups um, waging war against sovereign states um, seeking to determine their own future free of imperialism. So they, the sanctions and unilateral course of measures are unlawful in and of themselves. They are direct violation of the UN Charter. But furthermore and beyond that, they are backed up by the direct military power, which is an even greater violation of international law. Now, this, you know, under, again, once again, under the UN Charter, to which the United States is a signatory, and which has been ratified by the United States, giving it the full legal authority of constitutional and domestic law. Under this framework, dialogue and cooperation on an international level are mandatory legal obligations under international law. Now, of course, we can look at the behavior of the United States and say that it hasn't practiced that for a moment in its history, um, whether domestic whether domestically or internationally, and that is true. But it's also true that the weight of law lies um, with the people who are fighting back against imperialism rather than with the imperialist perpetrators of impunity and war crimes around the world. And there are a whole series of um, international conventions and human rights documents that underline this concept, including the Vienna Declaration of 1993, which explicitly requires states to refrain from unilateral coercive measures and, and highlights that this kind of trade warfare is a grave breach of international law and that this breach is just as grave whether we're talking about so-called smart sanctions, which are allegedly being used to target certain individuals or certain types of trade or comprehensive sanctions um, like the, a complete blockade on a given country. Because in reality, given the way that the financial system works and the level of interaction between government officials and different types of industry, any form of so-called smart sanction is actually in many ways a comprehensive sanction on the country. So what's, um, and we see this, you know, one of the clearest examples of this when we, is when we look at the Israeli blockade and siege on Gaza which Israel continues to justify claiming that it is, you know, preventing arms from entering Gaza. And in fact, I mean, obviously, when we look at Palestinians in Gaza, we see tremendous examples of resilience to siege and sanctions. We see that, in fact, resistance movements can develop their own weaponry, even um, when faced by these kinds of sanctions. But of course, what this also means in practice for people is that cement can't enter because it could theoretically be used for weapons. And of course, it can also be used to rebuild houses, that fuel can't enter, that all of these very basic um, necessities for life cannot enter under the concept of so-called targeted sanctions. And so we see this time and time again from country to country. And of course, these kinds of unilateral course of measures um, infringe most dramatically um, on the most vulnerable people in the population, women, children, persons with disabilities, people living in poverty, people who need access to health care, and that these are a direct and fundamental violation of human rights, the most fundamental human rights, self-determination, sovereignty, development, housing, health care. These are the rights that are directly attacked by unilateral coercive measures and sanctions. So when the United States or the European Union or Canada or any other imperialist power claims that it is moving forward with sanctions because it is uh, concerned about human rights violations in a targeted country, we can see first and foremost that not only is this hypocritical, it's completely deceptive and it's completely the opposite because the sanctions themselves are the cause of human rights violations, not a response to human rights violations. Today, one third of humanity in the world is affected in some way by unilateral course of measures. And of course, we know many of the cases um, 
you know, some of the most prominent and most heavily targeted countries include Iran, as well as Cuba, Syria, Zimbabwe, Venezuela. When we look at history, we look at how Iraq was destroyed and the role that sanctions played over decades in leading to destruction and devastation in Iraq and the very difficult work um, that the Iraqi people face in attempting to rebuild them, their economy and their society after decades of devastation, not just through war occupation and invasion, but also through years of sanctions. When we look at what's happening today in Lebanon, when we speak about the financial crisis, the difficulty that Lebanon will have finding its way out of this financial crisis, the effect of ongoing U.S. sanctions that have already led to the dismantlement of two large banks in Lebanon cannot be excluded from the equation. Um, what we see with the use of unilateral course of measures is extraterritoriality, the attempt of one state to impose its law and its restrictions and its violations of human rights on people around the world. It's a very serious breach of sovereignty and a very serious threat to any form of any concept of an international rule of law. Now, in many ways, imperialism has made a mockery of the concept of an international rule of law for generations and decades, and perhaps has always been a mockery. But um, the level of blatant violation of any concept, um, it's an attempt to insist on the promulgation of a unipolar world, even when the world is growing in its multipolarity, and there are multiple examples of countries and states and developing powers that refuse to be subjected to US authority and hegemony. And so there's an attempt to reimpose that hegemony, not just through, you know, quote unquote competition, but through direct uh, force, violence, power. And one of the most violent forms, you know, during the lead up to the second Iraq war, there were all of these voices calling for sanctions, not war. Well, sanction, it's, not an, it's not a choice, sanctions, not war. Sanctions is war. And so when we talk about whether, where the U.S. is engaged in wars, we must see that every target of U.S. sanctions around the world is an active act of war that is, being that is taking place on an ongoing and daily basis by the United States against these countries. So um, the... We've seen that the U.S. is losing, and to some degree, the United, United States officials, as Nina noted, have stated that they're going to go back to the United Nations Security Council and attempt to impose these so-called snapback sanctions on Iran under the nuclear agreement, which the United States has already left. The United States already lost a vote on this issue, uh, 13 to 3, uh, just last month, and they're attempting to bring it back again. Um, the U.S. is also facing a loss in October when the arms embargo on Iran put in place by the Security Council is set to expire. And the US wants to reimpose that arms embargo. So not only is it strengthening through these normalization agreements, its military encirclement of Iran, it also wants to continue to deny Iran the right to defend itself. And it wants to force other countries to become complicit in its human rights violations and its attacks on Iranian sovereignty and self-determination. Not that those countries are not already complicit, but it wants to further deepen their complicity by arguing that those, that those sanctions, um, that they will impose secondary sanctions. So thus any country that engages in um, arms trade, for example, with Iran and, uh, and in, a, in the normal sense that Iran, like every other country in the world, has the right to develop its self-defense resources, um, will be subject to further sanctions by the United States. And this is, of course, the same thing that the US has attempted to do with countries around the world. And it's important to note that while, for example, the European Union has issued a number of statements critical of US sanctions and the attempt to impose the snapback on Iran, um, if the EU goes along with the sanctions and, and implements them in practice, it doesn't matter if they didn't vote for it. They are fully complicit in the US's attacks on international law and human rights. Um, and another important aspect of the sanctions that doesn't always, you know, it doesn't necessarily have the same direct and deep human impact, but it does have a global impact on the international right to freedom of expression and freedom of information. And that's the way in which US tech companies have, begin, have become uh, perpetrators of sanctions, shutting down the accounts of 
news outlets and agencies in Iran, Venezuela, and elsewhere. So we've seen Press TV, for example, uh, kicked off of Facebook. We've seen a number of Venezuelan outlets kicked off. This is in addition, of course, to the kind of discriminatory labeling that we see. So for example, on YouTube, you might see that Press TV is labeled as an outlet funded by the Iranian government, or that roughly is funded as, is funded by the Russian government, but you can look at France 24, the BBC, and you don't get those warning labels. And you don't get that, that kind of um, violation. I mean, when the Committee of Anti-Imperialists in Solidarity with Iran set up its Twitter account, before it even made its first tweet, it was suspended and had to be re-verified. And it's very difficult to see that happening for any other reason than that it had Iran in the name. And there's this ongoing crackdown of any, on any kind of expression of accounts associated with Iran. And the justification used for that is um, that you know, Twitter and Facebook and these companies are US companies that have an obligation to comply with US sanctions. Now, of course, there is resistance. We look and we see the growing trade between Venezuela and Iran. We see the every single oil tanker from Iran to Venezuela, every time there are Iranian goods in Venezuelan stores and vice versa. This is commerce, this is trade. It isn't even uh, necessarily solidarity, but what it is is showing that the countries of the global south can and will continue to trade with each other and develop their independent and self-determined economies outside of the framework of US hegemony and outside of the direct US military threats to confiscate and attack ships. When we see the South and Lebanon rebuilding after the 2006 war, despite the labeling of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization and the sanctions imposed upon it, that is an example of resilience in the face of sanctions. When we see hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets in Yemen, facing famine and sanctions and devastation to protest for Palestine, this is an example of resilience. And just as mentioned earlier, when we see the resistance in Gaza developing its own industry and people seeking ways to fuel themselves, to develop cars and medical devices that run through solar energy and that use indigenous materials to rebuild homes in Gaza, this is an example of resilience and steadfastness under sanctions. However, of course, resilience and steadfastness is not enough. Solidarity is critical, particularly meaningful solidarity from the countries of the West whose governments are responsible for these massive crimes against one third of the people of the world. So when we talk about fighting back against unilateral coercive measures, at the international level, we do see um, there's the struggle in the United Nations, there's the struggle at the UN Human Rights Council, there's the pushback against the US's attempt to impose it's a uh, direct and violent hegemony on the world. There's litigation, um, like we see at the International Court of Justice or the World Court. Um, so far, there have been rulings in favor of Iran, where it has brought the United States um, to court for its sanctions, including that the U.S.'s sanctions must not violate, uh, must not focus, must not have humanitarian effects, and that the treaty that Iran is seeking to have um, is some, the Treaty of Amity from 1955 is something that the court can address. Now the US is trying to get that case dismissed again just this week at the same time that they're trying to go back to the Security Council on sanctions. Um, but there are hearings this week which are once again addressing the issue of whether the court has jurisdiction. Now, of course, even if the court decides in favor of Iran, there isn't an enforcement power. But once again, what we see the same thing that's happening at the International Criminal Court which are these endless hearings over the matter of whether the court can even hear the issue in the first place. And that's accompanied by a US sanctions and terror campaign against the courts as well. So like in the case of the International Criminal Court, two leading members of the prosecutorial staff were just subjected to individual OFAC sanctions attempting to criminalize dealing with the International Criminal Court out of any attempt to hold U.S. officials or Israeli officials accountable for their war crimes and crimes against humanity. But our question, and I think the question for us, isn't just the question of litigation, although that is an important question as well, including the ways in which we could potentially challenge these kinds of unilateral course of measures in domestic courts as well, keeping in mind that international law is domestic law in the United States and is, and that the United States government is currently violating those laws. 
but how we can build at a political and social level to show the kind of solidarity that Max described earlier to the people that are facing down the barrel of the gun with these sanctions. Um, we see organizations like Sanctions Kill, we see people coming out to protest. When there's a threat of a shooting war, we do see people come to take the streets. Um, people in the United States do not want to have a war on Iran. People in the United States didn't want to have a war on Iraq either. But the question is, how can we build our movements to be stronger and powerful enough to show support to the people around the world that are facing down um, a really merciless empire? Um, what can, how can we build our power so that we can shut it down, so that we can show material and critical solidarity because sanctions and unilateral coercive measures are acts of war. They are an attempt to destroy lives. Even as people are resilient and struggle and continue to survive, this is an attempt to wear that down and it's not something that should be acceptable. And it's why it's so critical, I think, right now for something like Cassie to come to light to build together, to organize and struggle, to fight back against unilateral coercive measures, and to fight back against all of the mechanisms of war that imperialism uses to achieve its bloody ends. Thank you so much. That was excellent, Charlotte, and everybody. Thank you very much. Um, it was, all of you were truly excellent. Um, now we have some time for question and answer and comments and discussion. So um, you can feel free to post comments in the chat box um, or in the question and answer box. Um, we have one question from Broad Such in the Q&A box. How do you distinguish between sanctions against Iran and Venezuela and sanctions against Israel, apartheid South Africa, or the Philippines? Um, does somebody want to take that? I can answer as well, but does somebody else want to take that while I go through the other questions? Charlotte, do you want to take that? Um, sure. So um, I think that that's why I think it's actually important to use the term unilateral course of measures. Um, in the first place, the sanctions on South Africa were uh, properly and legally executed under the UN Security Council. And of course, this was also taking place at um, a different time in which there was actually some, there was a greater global balance of power in the world. I mean, this was a time when it was possible for the Zionism is racism resolution to pass in the United Nations, um, something that was later kind of forcibly rescinded under US pressure later on. Um, in terms of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, the vast majority of what the campaigns are actually for is demanding an end to preferential trade deals and demanding an end to U.S. military aid and similar practices. So we're not even talking about the kinds of unilateral course of measures being enforced in these cases. Um, in the case of the Philippines, uh, there's no call from the movement in the Philippines for sanctions. There's a call for the U.S. to stop giving military aid to the government of the Philippines. So in, in essence, what we're really doing in all of these cases is we're looking at the same perpetrator and the same demands. Um, because again, we can't ex exempt the question of sanctions from the question of imperialism. And so the U.S. is using unilateral course of measures in order to perpetrate its imperial, its imperial goals. And it's for those same reasons that it's providing military aid to Israel and military aid to the Philippines. And it's for the same reason that the United States uh, supported apartheid South Africa for decades, viewing it as a bulwark against communism in Africa. And so it, um, when we are, the global call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions is a grassroots call to stop the complicity of the United States, the European Union, Canada, and other countries with the war crimes and violations being carried out 
by um, governments which are acting as agents of imperialism or full-fledged imperial partners in the region. And apartheid South Africa was the same thing, an apartheid settler colonial project, um, similar in many ways and different in other ways to the Israeli state or for that matter to the United States and Canada. Um, so again, I, I would differentiate these on several levels. In the first place, what we're looking at is really this concept of the U.S. imperialist as the number one terrorist. It's both the sanctioner of Iran and the provider of military aid to Israel. And these things come together and they can't really be separated from one another. But that in the cases of these other countries, the actual demand is that our government stop aiding and directly supporting and funding the war crimes that are taking place, which is uh, a quite different matter than attempting to isolate people from the global economic system. And on a second level, I think it is important, I would differentiate the Philippines from Israel and South Africa in this regard as well, because the call in the Philippines is really specifically about military aid. Um, and furthermore, it's the Philippines isn't a settler colonial state, but Israel and apartheid South Africa are. And so you did, you had in both of those cases, um, indigenous people who are being denied their sovereignty and self-determination through the creation of a settler colonial project, which was part and parcel of, um, of imperialism. And so uh, sanctions on South Africa are not meant to be sanctions on the African people and its leadership, nor are, they, nor are sanctions on Israel, um, sanctions on the Palestinian people and their movement. And so I do think it's important to differentiate those things and also look at the responsibility of imperialism in this matter as well. Nina, would you like to add? Great, thank you. We have a bunch of other questions and I think you answered that really comprehensively. So I'm, I'm gonna um, uh, ask the next question. Um, one person asks, what does anti-imperialist political action look like in the United States? Following these necessary theoretical and empirical red posts, what can the anti-imperialist left offer people located in the US and Europe in terms of ideas, recommendations, and theories for action? Anything beyond Code Pink, code pink style rallies in DC? I ask because lacking this vital component, I believe we risk abandoning the struggle over political action to the imperialist left, which has made ready-made ready -made solutions to the problems it poses, for example, die-ins in front of Russian embassies. Uh, does somebody want to take that? Nobody wants to take it? Should I take it? Um, Okay, um, so I think that um, we, we thought a lot about this when we created the organization. And one thing that's very vital in this moment is clarity of analysis. And um, so part of our objective is to provide clarity of analysis around anti-imperialism and, and specifically around Iran. Um, in terms of action, uh, I think it was incredible to see in January that people actually came out into the streets against war on Iran. Up until uh, this past winter, uh, when we went to anti-war protests or anti-sanctions protests against Iran um, in support of Iran, uh, very few people showed up. So the movement is definitely on the upswing. I think part of the reason that we saw as much support against war on Iran um, is because the mainstream media supported it. And they, their position was really an anti-Trump administration position. It was not entirely an anti-war position. Um, what I think the, the anti-imperialist left needs to do right now is to exploit, to continue to exploit the contradictions between the establishment and the far right, the, the pro-Trump far right. The more that we can exploit those contradictions and the more, that, the more power we can create for ourselves, um, it's tough in the, in the times of the pandemic to think about how to do uh, broad-based action. Um, many of us can't go out in the streets for a variety of reasons. And so in the short term, um, our focus is gonna be on clarity of analysis and on developing an anti-sanctions campaign. Um, we will engage in action in the streets when necessary. Um, hopefully it won't be necessary in the short term. 
um, but it's tough to, in, to, to envision broad-based action um, in this moment. That said, um, I think we have to build alliances as broadly as possible. Um, the people who are out in the streets over the summer uh, fighting for abolition of the prison industrial complex um, know full well that abolition of the prison industrial complex is not possible without ending imperialism because a lot of prisoners of war are in US prisons and detention centers. And migrants who left their countries and their homelands because of US wars are in detention centers in the United States. There's no way to abolish the prison system and the, the immigration system in the United States without ending imperialism. Anti-imperialism is fundamental to virtually every major political struggle in the US right now. And if we can educate people about these connections, then we will, I think, take significant steps forward beyond um, the actions that the person who asked the question mentioned, um, beyond just rallies, your standard rallies and protests. Um, does anybody else want to answer that question? There are more, there are a couple more. Um, somebody asked an important question. There's a lot of clarity around Palestine. Um, people are very willing to support the Palestinian struggle increasingly, much more than they used to be. But those same people are not willing often to, to support, um, to be against sanctions on Iran or to really go out and support um, against war on Iran. Um, does somebody want to talk about why that problem exists? Max or Vida, or both yeah. of you? Sure. I mean, I think part of the problem is that um, as the, the, some of the strategy that was very successfully used to uh, what's called mainstream Palestine um, within a broad liberal left public has uh, occurred alongside a uh, kind of stripping of a broader anti-imperialist uh, analytic from understanding Palestine and at the same time as a decline of anti-imperialist theory and analysis within the broader left. So I think these trends went hand in hand. So uh, there is, uh, there, there used, it used to be much more widespread, really, the idea that the U.S. is supporting Israel for reasons having nothing to do with imperialism. I mean, I feel this was far more widespread uh, 10 years ago than it is now. Um, and it, that analysis, pushing that analysis, uh, had a lot of collateral damage within the ability of the Palestine Solidarity Movement itself to offer a more coherent analysis of what's going on in Palestine. We've also seen a great deal of theoretical and academic work, which has totally de-regionalized the Palestine question from uh, both its alliance system within the region and also the Arab national question. So 95% uh, of work that's done on Palestine basically rips it out of its historic uh, insertion into uh, the broader Arab peoples, which is the Arab strategic depth, depth now, also including Iran, which has actually traditionally been uh, the strength and uh, the wellspring of, of Palestinian capacity to effectively resist. and. Um, on the flip side of it, Israel was traditionally understood by the Arab nationalist movement and cognate uh, governments and also the, the Arab left as the spears point of U.S. imperialism in the region. All of that understanding has been utterly evacuated from uh, the analysis that has been uh, pushed by the Palestine Solidarity Movement, um, or at least the more prominent parts of it, large portions of which are funded by uh, the Rockefeller Foundation and you know other large capitalist foundations that are actually working to subvert um, anti-Zionism in the United States. Um, and you know if we don't have an awareness of what those mechanisms of foundation-funded counterinsurgency are, we are not equipped to understand what they're doing and how effectively to resist them and to repoliticize uh, certain aspects of 
the the work around Palestine that have been uh, depoliticized. I mean, and the, there is a large scale assault on the idea and practice of anti-imperialism in the United States. Um, this is across the entire U.S. left, and so people don't think people think of supporting Palestine as anti-apartheid, anti-colonialism, pro-human rights. All of those are perfectly valid frames, but without anti-imperialism, they're severed from a broader understanding of what the U.S. agenda is. Um, and there is a widespread, well-funded uh, NGO and foundation-supported um, so-called Western Marxist left-funded uh, attempt to basically remove anti-imperialism or to demonize it as supporting the mullahs, supporting Stalin, uh, supporting Gaddafi, um, supporting, you know, drinking the, the blood of subaltern children and so forth. I mean, all these uh, ludicrous framings that actually have nothing to do with uh, anti-imperialist, radical, progressive politics and have everything to do with uh, supporting an agenda that supports the U.S. Thank you, Max. Um, Vida, John, do you want to answer this as well? Um, no, I, I agree with Max. It's, um, it's also, there's such a campaign of um, misinformation about Iran that is uh, not just by the US government, but also the media, the mainstream media, that um, I think people have a hard time to understand <laughs> who's, you know, what's true and what's not true. Um, so I think it's, it's hard to kind of see what is going on in Iran for the, for the public. Um, yeah. So that's something that needs to be combated. And hopefully an anti-imperialist movement can, can address some of those issues. I think it's important to know that historically, Iranians and Palestinians, the people, um, have expressed incredible solidarity to one another. Be beyond solidarity, they've uh, worked together side by side against uh, US, and U.S. imperialism and Israeli colonialism. Um, and that history is recent enough that, um, I, that we can build on it. Uh, that we can revive it um, to the extent that it's to, that it's being uh, people are trying to destroy it. We can continue to revive it. Um, there was a question. There was a question. Um, okay, so the, maybe the last two questions. We have five minutes left. Um, where do you see China fitting into the situation? You're responding to Western imperialism in West Asia unilateral coercive measures, political interference, and where do you see them fitting into the work that you do? Um, and then um, another question um, about the Islamic Republic. It's a dis di theocratic dictatorship that oppresses a lot of people and has aggressive foreign policy in the region. Um, Aside from hatred of the United States and Israel, what progressive values does the government government of Iran embody that makes it worth defending? Um, and then we, there's another question. That's it. I think that's it. Um, this, so those two questions. Does anybody want to take them? Okay, I'll take the. I'm going to take the Islamic Republic question. Well, you all ponder the other questions. <laughs> um, uh, I, I th first of all, I think it's a red herring to qu ask what progressive values the Islamic Republic embodies that are worth defending. But I'll answer it, even though I think it's a red herring. And I'll say that uh, Max actually mentioned it. Uh, women, the, the literacy rate among women has increased exponentially. Uh, the, the majority of students at the university level are women. Women are involved in every aspect of the workforce. Um, the medical infrastructure in the country um, is excellent, or was excellent before the sanctions. It was truly excellent. Uh, there were rural clinics established all throughout the country, and students who graduated from medical school were required to, to spend time in those clinics uh, before 
certainly there are things to defend. The distribution of wealth, the, the wealth gap that existed during the era of the Shah was narrowed um, in the early days of the Islamic Republic. So certainly there, there are aspects of the Islamic Republic to defend, but that is not what we're here to do. We're not mm -hmm. here to defend the Islamic Republic. We're not here to defend any other government throughout the world. What we're here to do is to defend the rights of the Iranian people to have sovereignty from U.S. imperialism. That's it. If the U.S. and Israel get their hands and their weaponry and their neoliberal institutions out of Iran, then the people of Iran, the people who currently live there, can decide for themselves what kind of government they want, whatever that government looks like. I'm not even talking about myself as an Iranian who lives in the United States. I'm talking about the people inside Iran. They get to choose. I don't support imperialism. I don't support imperialism against Iran. I don't support imperialism against any other country throughout the world. So I have stood steadfastly as an anti-imperialist for as long as I can remember against in support of every other nation in this world. And that's what we're asking you to do. We're not asking anybody to defend the Islamic Republic of Iran. We're asking you to stand against imperialism and in favor of people's sovereignty and control of their own destinies, land, and resources. That is it. Does anybody want to add? Perfect. Okay. Um, the China question? I'll give it a stab. Um, yeah, I thought I was muted. Um, so I think uh, China is playing a contradictory role in uh, the world system. And I think part of what we, especially in, um, in the United States, uh, need to do is wrestle uh, with that contradictory role and not, uh, not praise what should be condemned and not condemn uh, what, what should be praised. I mean, we should think about how and when China could be taking actions for its own reasons that are defending the interests of the poor and the dispossessed and the colonized in the world and, and when it's not. And so I would, I would push that perspective overall as a kind of overall guiding frame, at least for how I and I think is I will, it would be beneficial for others to begin to see China. I mean, um, but to, to put it slightly more specifically, um, you know, China was uh, the major source of, um, of development and popular development and um, well-being kind of on a world scale in the second half of the 20th century. Um, in some places, uh, it had uh, bad foreign policy even during the Maoist period, and it's continued to, in some places, have a bad foreign policy in the post-Maoist period, for example, uh, in the Philippines. On the other hand, it is able to offer uh, rebuild, uh, funds for rebuilding. It's able to offer diplomatic support. It does not want a US-dominated uh, world system. It wants to be able to uh, exchange, um, to purchase energy and materials from West Asia, especially Iran. Um, without China, it, it's possible that some of these countries in West Asia, especially Iran, would have, uh, would have collapsed or at least been far more severely damaged under the weight of economic sanctions. And that's because uh, capital, the, the process of accumulation in uh, China is directed by the state. The state is carrying out its own agenda that uh, consists of actually building up a um, uh, certain form of infrastructure that is often uh, based on accumulation within China, but is also based on actually building up uh, productive assets that are uh, that it wants to defend. It does not want to see them destroyed, and it doesn't want other countries that it trades with to uh, to be destroyed. It is making uh, profit from trade rather than the U.S. Uh, modus operandi, which is to make profit from destruction. So those imperatives uh, often clash. I mean, in other, place, in, in other places, though, to, in those like the Philippines, uh, those imperatives uh, do not clash. Um, but in West Asia, I think those imperatives very often clash. I mean, uh, China, sh uh, it would be great if China were doing more 
to directly confront um, the U.S. Um, it, it, the Chinese policy in regards to Palestine is, is far from supportive of Palestinian liberation. On the other hand, it is backstopping uh, Syria and it is backstopping Iran. And without it, uh, the situation would be much worse. So I think holding those contradictions is very important as we try to understand the role China is playing in the world and how we orient to the role that China is playing in the world, especially living in the West where China is increasingly under the imperialist gun sites itself, precisely for this counterbalancing role that it's playing on a world scale. Any last comments? Before we close? I, I just wanted to make a brief comment. I agree with everything that Max said about China. I just wanted to kind of bring a case up as an example. And this is the Huawei case, which is taking place. Um, I mean, we've seen that the United States was more than happy to for Chinese labor to be employed to produce goods to benefit U.S. Tech, tech corporations. But the development of even an indigenous tech corporation in China, Huawei, that, is, that exists in relation to the state and is not governed by primarily by U.S. Uh, hegemonic interests is seen as a threat that needs to be attacked at all mean, by all means, including the imposition of a number of um, penalties, restrictions, and even criminal prosecutions. Right now in Vancouver, um, Meng Wanzhou, who's the chief financial officer of Huawei, is being held in house arrest uh, because she was trying to transit through Vancouver Airport, stopping in Canada uh, while flying to Latin America. Um, and she was arrested. She was pulled out, arrested on a U.S. extradition warrant. Why does the U.S. want to try Meng Wanzhou? It has nothing to do with exploitation of labor. It has nothing to do with all of the critiques of China that someone might level. It has to do with accusing Huawei of violating the sanctions against Iran. And so when we talk about what's happening right now between the US and China, I think especially for those of us organizing in say the US and Canada and Europe um, in the West in general, it's very critical for us to fight back against this attempt to um, create a new Cold War, which is in many ways an attempt for the US to gain, once again, complete impunity and complete hegemony in a unipolar world for it to carry out its imperialist designs in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, um, especially in Iran and in the Arab world. Uh, thank you all very much. That was excellent. And thank you to everybody who joined. Um, we uh, There will be a recording of this available on the Facebook page, I believe, Charlotte. I think would know more. And then, um, as I said earlier, yes, is that correct? Yes. And it's already there right now, so people can go check it out. And then um, it's also going to be aired on East as a podcast, which I encourage you to uh, listen to and follow regularly. Um, uh, and like I said earlier, if you would like to join, we take individual members, um, and you can go to our website and just sign up, and then you'll be contacted soon. Uh, by one of our current members um, so that we can begin the process of you joining the organization. And we're going to have a membership meeting for new members sometime in October. Um, lastly, there was one question that I think is worth mentioning. Now, it's more of a, it's a question, but I'm just going to assert it as a comment. Somebody asked, is there a racial element to all this shaming and tone policing Iranians get from Western liberals and leftists? There are a lot of Iranians. I can see a lot of Iranian names on the um, list of folks who joined. And I, I'd like to say that I think we should all remember that there is indeed a racial element to the tone policing, the political policing that Iranians get, um, not just by um, the mainstream, but in, in the left, especially. And that's one of the things that we want to try to combat, um, the, the racial tone policing that this person, this person specifically mentioned. Um, so thank you again, everybody. And, um, uh, best wishes uh, during these troubled times. Take care.